Okay, good afternoon. This is my Madonna moment with my headset. Um, so my session is called Opening the EEF's Teaching and Learning Toolkit. I'm going to talk about the Education Endowment Foundation, some of the work we do around evidence. I'm going to dig into the toolkit of evidence that we have um, and also dig in a little bit further into topics like feedback. I'm going to look at a project um, which involved Dylan William, um, who we know well, and look at how at the EEF in England, we've been mobilizing evidence, sharing it with teachers, and building an infrastructure in schools in England to share the likes of the expertise that we have today. Um, and then talk to you a little bit at the end around some of the interesting global, international developments that are happening too. Um, a very quick introduction for my role. So I mentioned this morning, I've been a teacher for over 15 years. I've just joined the EEF on the basis really that I've been spending a lot of time communicating research evidence to teachers, helping train teachers, helping write for teachers about topics like feedback um, and, you know, and, and research evidence. So my role has become a bit of a, a broker or a middleman between schools and researchers and to help cross that boundary because what we know is that researchers are often writing for a different audience. They're writing for other researchers. Teachers want to read and be trained on evidence, but they want practical strategies. So my role is often to try and mediate the two. And at the Education Endowment Foundation, we're working very hard to try and focus on what we call knowledge mobilization on really sharing that evidence in a way that's useful and interesting for teachers to use in the classroom, in the management rooms where we make decisions about our school. So that's my role. Firstly, I think there's a, a point which might be a bit implicit, this question, why use evidence? Why do teachers use evidence? Why should school leaders use evidence? Why should policymakers use evidence? And actually, there's lots of good reasons. Primarily, children and their learning and us making best bets and making best judgments and choices based on the available evidence. And also, actually, we need that support. No one can be expert in all of the research. Certainly not busy teachers and school leaders. So I've got a quick question for you, and I want you to um, just read these two projects. They're two EEF projects. I'll talk about them in a little bit more depth. They're both about improving reading, reading comprehension, the, your skill of reading um, for children of primary school age. And I just want you to have, you can discuss with the person next to you in terms of which project you think was more successful than the other and why. Was it project one? Was it project two? But crucially, why do you think it was more successful? I'll just give you a minute or two to think through those two projects. Give it a read. Okay, feel free to talk. What are the ingredients that you think of those projects that might make it successful? What is needed? Which is better and why? Bring your expertise to those two examples. Okay, now I'm going to ask for some feedback. Not personally, don't worry. 
but can you do a show of hands when I name each project? So if you think project one was more successful, put your hand up and then project two. So first, hands up if you thought project one was the more successful project. Okay, quite a lot. Now hands up project two. Okay, that's really interesting because we've got basically 50-50 which shows we're probably guessing. Um, when that happens in the classroom and you ask for a show of hands, if you get big differences, you know that they're not quite sure, so you probably need to teach it again. Um, I think you're right to be you know, a bit circumspect. There's lots of information we're not getting here, but how many times as a school leader, as a school teacher, are we making a good guess and, and choosing a strategy because we think it might work? And actually, we don't have time to look at the evidence. We don't have time to look at projects, to look at what's happening at the school down the road. So we have to make quick, best fit decisions, best bets. So let's reveal the answers. This is the bit in the classroom that all the students like. Okay, so let me introduce the language a little. So FSM means free school meals. So in England, that's an indicator for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the month's progress, I'll come to in a moment, but effectively, that's tried to translate effect sizes into something that teachers and parents can understand. So two months' progress would indicate they're making improvements. Minus two months would mean that actually, compared to business as usual, compared to children who are just turning up to school, actually, they're getting worse compared to business as usual. So, all those people who put your hand up for project one, actually, what we found out from doing a randomized controlled trial, from taking a large sample of children, then randomly dividing them and dividing the number of schools, then the schools that undertook this project, called Chatterbooks, actually the children got worse at reading compared to children at the control school who just did school as normal. Now, if we go back to this, project one doesn't look like a bad thing, does it? It looks like there's some sensible things in there, there's things we recognize. Motivation, we know motivation matters. We know that that can sustain children as they're learning. You know, if they're more motivated to read, they're less likely to give up, they're likely to practice more, etc. And yet, how this project was delivered, supported, implemented, it didn't work. And there's something about motivation alone won't improve your reading. You need more strategic support, more instruction. Now, Chatterbooks, Project One, was actually a project that the Department for Education, the English government, liked so much, they spent five million bringing it to English schools. And yet, the evidence for Chatterbooks shows that on average, in a large number of schools, it had a negative effect. Now, that should, shouldn't say to us, well, we're never going to do anything like Chatterbooks ever again. What it should indicate is that actually, let's look closely at the ingredients of getting better at reading. Let's try and make sure we carefully implement that in our school. Let's make sure we're using the best available approaches. And Chatterbooks has got some problems. So it's not just about giving children books. We know actually from America, from England, from around the world, that book giving is something we love to do. And I'm not saying book giving is a bad thing. I love books and I love reading. It's one of the reasons why I became a teacher. However, just giving books to children whether they're going for their holidays with those books, whether they just take them home, they're at the bottom of their bag. Book giving alone seems to generally have no impact on reading, no impact on motivation, and even you know, less impact on reading outcomes and your reading ability. Now, that doesn't mean we should never give books away. It means we should think about what support factors are required if we're giving a children a book if they're going to go away and read it independently? What strategies for reading have they practiced? Do parents have strategies to support them to read at home, outside of the classroom? So it doesn't tell us what not to do, 
but it raises questions about what we're doing. And then we look at project two, switch on reading, and we look at that and we think, okay, so what were the ingredients of this that seemed to work, and what can we learn for ourselves in our school? So there was something around this online system that created goals for children, that the computer and the, the program was responsive to where their reading ability was, so actually it just challenged them and it, it brought their reading on in a short space of time. And actually, beyond the headlines, we need to find out a lot more before we're going to say, okay, let's do project two in our school and expect it to work. And too many times in education, we get government or policymakers, or I've, I, I've been a school leader, school leaders, and we think it's work down the road in a school. That school's a bit like my school. Let's do it here. And what we miss are the crucial ingredients about why it worked in the school down the road. So evidence can challenge our assumptions, and it should. Evidence can slow us down and change our decisions. Evidence should make us think harder. Evidence can never give us all the answers. And actually, depending on your school context, the needs of your pupils, the training of your teachers, Project One might work effectively in your school, but we're raising a set of questions. And, and one of the depressing things we know when we do some good evaluation, and we at the EF do lots and lots and lots of trials, is that the reality, despite millions of pounds of investment, is that most things fail. Now, that doesn't mean that we should all, you know, kind of walk home depressed sad that, that our kind of careers as teachers and leaders are kind of f you know, doomed to failure. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that making changes in schools really hard. We need to invest lots of time and energy in training and supporting teachers. We need to think about the support factors for teachers, for our students, and for their parents and families. And that actually we probably need to do fewer things really well and evaluate whether they're working in our school context. So at the EEF, we're not here giving you silver bullets. There is not a new set of answers that you've not heard before. Yet when we open the toolkit, and I'll, I'll share that very soon, actually, there are things that probably indicate they are better bets than doing other things. And yet implementation matters. How we bring it to our school context matters. We might do a fantastic program on reading, and yet, if we take one of the ingredients out of the program, it might be weekly meeting with teachers about how it's going. If we take that one little thread out, everything falls down. And that's where evidence can make us think much harder about what we do. And as a teacher in the classroom, you want to be supported to make changes, but also to think hard about them because we're too busy and our job's too important to guess and to just pluck things out of the air or from the classroom down the corridor or down the road and hope it works. So just really quickly, just so you can judge the evidence that I share here, that you can question the evidence that I share here, the Education Endowment Foundation is an independent charity. We were given a large um, founding grant of 125 million by the Department for Education uh, over seven years ago. And our aim is to focus our support on disadvantaged children in England, but actually to try and create an infrastructure in England where evidence, where children engaging in projects becomes normal. So we've got over 160 projects. We've got you know, that huge number of children involved and well over 10,000 schools have been involved in our projects. And in England, there's not many over 20,000 schools. So we're really trying to create an infrastructure to support schools to do these things well. Right from big projects to small changes that they're looking to make in school. Because we can come to events like Research Ed and it can inspire us and it can fire us with ideas. But when we go back on Monday, one person will never be enough. We need teams of people. We need an infrastructure which shares the evidence that inspires us, translates the evidence 
that might inspire us and helps teachers get to grip with it and work with it. So we are just one of the players in the English school system that is helping that process. And actually Research Ed is another of those prominent players because over the next few weeks, I'll be spending my Saturdays in Blackpool, in Birmingham, with 500 teachers each time who are learning that extra knowledge. But they need to go back to their school and speak to their school leaders and head teachers and actually have a really important dialogue about what support is needed to carry that on. Because otherwise, we all go to the circus and then the circus leaves town and teachers are left back to square one, knowing lots more, but not able to do anything with it. What we do, um, if I simplify in this diagram, we generate evidence. So actually, we commission universities to do literature reviews. So one of the things I was involved in was a literature review for metacognition. Um, we're just about to initiate a big literature review for feedback. So we've asked questions from people like Dylan William to get that real expert feedback ab about feedback. Um, so we generate evidence and then we synthesize evidence. And at the top there, this is where the toolkit is one of our key tools in trying to make a one-stop shop for teachers and school leaders to start that conversation around things that may be useful to focus on for their decisions. So I'll, I'll dig into the toolkit in a moment. But what we know, crucially, is that evidence mobilization is the critical gap in our schools. That you can have a school involved in the project, but that doesn't include every teacher. You can have teachers coming to research ed, and yet they go back to school and feel like they're shouting into the void on their own because other people in the school don't share the same knowledge. So we have to have those supports to mobilize the evidence. And actually, we need people in our schools who can translate because often the research is just too hard to try and boil it down into actions we can undertake in the classroom on a wet Thursday afternoon when people are tired. So we need to be really practical about that as well. And we need to make sure there's professional judgment. Because if I go back to those first two projects early on, this, that wasn't to catch anyone out, that anyone was wrong. Because in your school, you could make any of those approaches work with the right active ingredients to make sure that happens. But also, as Dylan Williams said this morning in his video, you know, not everything works everywhere. And even when things generally seem like a very good thing, they can flail and fail in our school context, in our classroom. When I get to feedback later on, that's a great example of something that on average seems to be a very, very good thing and yet we also know where it fails and we might learn some messages about when feedback fails and why it fails. So that's always about professional judgment. You can't just take this off the shelf and then just plug it into your school curriculum and your teachers. It has to be mediated, understood, shared, practiced, trialed, and we need to have that dialogue as professionals. Just before I get to the toolkit, you've already seen this information at the bottom. So if you go on um, the EEF website, and, and I hope in the near future there'll be a translation, there's already um, translations for the countries, Spanish, etc. cetera, um, that you have the heading, feedback, and that obviously means quite a few different things underneath it. Then you've got um, the cost, so the estimated cost, and here you've got pound signs. So the more effective it is, the more pound signs come with it, and that's important. Because if we had an infinite amount of money, then we, we do some things and we do quite a lot of it. If we had extra millions in our school, we might do lots of one-to-one -one tutoring because we know that one-to-one -one tutoring is likely to be quite effective. But we don't have an infinite amount of money, so we're always making choices. We're almost making bets that one thing is likely to work. And if we don't need a big spend, then we could do that and other things at the same time. Then you've also got the estimated size of the effect. So that's the circle in orange at the far right hand side, the plus eight months for feedback. So the feedback is at the top of the toolkit. And what that is, is an average. Of all the studies, of all the meta-analysis, 
we've pulled that together and it creates an effect size. Now the effect size, effectively, as it says there, is a standardized mean difference. So here you've got one distribution about the schools who've undertaken feedback and you've got another distribution and then the difference between. So if you've got that school who didn't do the feedback approach and the school who did, there's a gap between them and that's where the effect sizes come in. Now an effect size of eight months, we use the months, it's not perfect, but we use it to try and communicate it to teachers. Effectively, that's an effect size of 0.65. So one month's gain or two months gain is an effect size of 0.1 or 0.2. But actually, an effect size of 0.1 over time is a really significant big gain. So it's not about trying to hit these big effect sizes. Actually, it's about just understanding you know, some of those statistics. And then also the padlocks is about the quality of evidence because not every project has been faithfully conducted. Not every evaluation is as robust. So we have to put padlocks on the different topics to indicate the strength of the evidence. So the strength of evidence for feedback is three padlocks, which is quite strong, but there are other topics um, such as mixed ability teaching, mixed attainment teaching, and the padlocks aren't as high because the quality of evidence in that area just isn't as strong. So that's a bit of an overview. Now the toolkit, if I was to cram it into one image here, I know you can't see it, but don't worry, the next slide will, will help quite a lot. The toolkit brings all of these areas together. So here's feedback, homework in primary, homework in secondary, learning styles, mastery learning, mentoring, metacognition. I want us to look at this next version, which is a bit of a simplified version of the graph. And what I've done here is we've done the, the money on the bottom axes. So from it being down here, where it doesn't cost much as a school to being far down there where it's quite expensive to do. And then on this axis, you've got the month's gain, the impact. And what you see is there's a cluster of headings and areas that seem to go together as more promising. Now, let's get this carefully right. We can't just go, okay, let's do more of the thing on the top and then everything will be great. We need to dig underneath it and, and get to more of the detail, but it gives us some good indicators. So if we look at just a couple of examples, on the far right-hand side, smaller class sizes, Okay, so smaller class sizes is very expensive. As Dylan William explained this morning, it has unintended consequences. Because in Texas, if you reduce your class sizes, you need more teachers. And if you reduce the quality of your teachers, then learning gets worse. So it's not a quick fix. If in our school, we reduced our class size from 30 to 25, the likelihood is that there's not much difference at all. The teacher might feel a bit different, might feel better, and that there's a bit more personalization. If the class goes from 25 to 20, the teacher might feel that they can give more feedback. But the evidence internationally would indicate that class size doesn't make big gains until the class size reduction is much bigger. So if you're reducing your class size from 30 to 15, then the likelihood of impact changes and you're likely to have some significant impacts. Now for teachers, class size is a very personal matter, isn't it? Because we always invariably want a smaller class because we feel like we can give them more attention, we can give them more feedback. It may be that we take their homework in and we can mark their work and give them more attention. But actually, we have to have the conditions. Teachers don't necessarily teach any better because the class is somewhat smaller. So when we see smaller class size, it might be a good thing. It might sound like a good thing. And we've got, there is an effect here of a couple of months difference, but it doesn't always happen. And it needs other ingredients to go with it to make a difference to children's learning. Now for policymakers and politicians, like those Texas politicians who spent billions of pounds reducing class size, they did that for a reason. 
why do politicians do things? Well, maybe for their morality, but also because it gets them votes. And reducing class size, parents like it. Parents will vote for that. So you know, there's a reason here to think hard about reducing class size. Because what I'm not saying is we should have you know, classes of 60 and just pile them all into auditoriums and never give them any personalization. But what I am saying is that on average, the evidence would indicate that just reducing class size alone doesn't make a great deal of difference and it's very expensive. What I want you to do is just have a minute or two to look at the topics in the promising area. Maybe you need to unpick a little about what the language means. Where it's got secondary in brackets, that means homework for older children. Homework for primary would fall down to about here because homework for younger children the effect isn't as strong on learning. For reasons we can probably guess, children, young children don't have the self-regulation, they don't have enough knowledge and skill to, to utilize homework as effectively as older children. So just have a look at those, have a discussion. Are, does anything surprise you? Why are some things you know, where they are? So one-to-one -one tutoring, quite high impact, but quite expensive. Can you easily do one-to-one -one tutoring or is feedback something that's more easily taken on in our school? Just have a one or two minute discussion to get underneath this toolkit and look at some of those headings. Okay, now some of your reflections may be that feedback, metacognition, homework, peer tutoring, so peer tutoring is where children teach one another. Often the, the toolkit indicates it's more effective when older children peer tutor younger children, but not exclusively. So there are some ingredients around these topics. But if you look at those, there's something around activating children as managing their own learning. Metacognition is about children being really strategic about tackling problems in maths, being really well organized about their homework, you know, about organizing their space, managing their time very effectively. Feedback is about the responses they get from their teacher and peers to make small improvements. So these seem to be low cost and they're about really training children to be independent learners. And yet, independent learners sometimes is a, a misconception for teachers that it just happens and it's a natural thing and you just develop that as you get older, when actually effective independent learning is well structured, it's well guided and scaffolded by the teacher. And when you dig underneath the toolkit, it's about getting under underneath those specifics. Otherwise, we're just looking at headlines that say this works, and we don't know why. So we must unpack the toolkit. Let's do that. Let's look at feedback as an example because it sits at the top. So actually in England, a few years back, feedback was a bit all the rage. But what people understood by feedback was quite variable. So on the toolkit page, you have some questions. We don't have easy answers. You have questions. What should we consider when we're thinking about feedback? So providing effective feedback is challenging. It's got to be specific, accurate, and clear. 
So saying that was great, saying correct, you know, giving a tick, giving praise, that doesn't really give children enough information to do anything with it to improve. Whereas if you can be specific, accurate, and clear, so as an English teacher, if I've just spent 20 minutes of my life marking an essay, I want them to make sure they use that time and they spend 20 minutes of their lives purposefully reflecting in a structured way on my feedback. But I need to be specific. So what did they do well? They might have opened up paragraphs with very clear sentences that gave them a strong argument. But then, really crucially, what do they need to do to get better? So they may not have drawn upon enough evidence. They may not have used quotations in their essay. And I need to be specific. And I need to re relay that feedback and then bring it back the next time they're doing a similar task. If they just take the feedback and then just disappear, oh great, I've just got some praise from my teacher, and they never really reflect and use that feedback, then it just disappears. So we've got to get underneath the real specifics. And the big question for me is feedback doesn't succeed or fail. Actually, feedback, we've got to first have a shared definition amongst teachers in our school. What do we mean by feedback? How does it look? Does it look different in maths than it looks in science? Does it look different in science than it looks in history? And it probably should. Because how you can give feedback on mathematical answers should be distinctively different to how I would give feedback on an extended essay. They're really different tasks, so the feedback should be different. And one of the big issues around just looking at evidence and seeing the headline, feedback's great, Dylan Williams says it's great, let's do it, everything will work out. Actually, Dylan Williams himself has shared this evidence so when you dig underneath all of that evidence, yes, feedback on average can have a big impact on learning, and yet a third of feedback interventions actually made learning worse. And what we don't want is our classroom and our school to be one of the third. So we need to really understand what we mean by feedback, break it down, get a shared language, shared strategies. In England, there was a big problem in that feedback didn't become oral feedback and questioning and, and lots of in, you know, intent and dialogue. It became making comments in children's books. That the children didn't spend much time reading or there was an elaborate dance where they wrote lots of things in their book and the teacher wrote back. And all it did was exhaust teachers who spent more hours marking outside of school and in their time in school and less time planning to teach great lessons. So we created, we commissioned Oxford University for this literature review about marking called a marked improvement. And what that shows is that on average, marking doesn't make much difference. And there are very specific ingredients that you need for marking to be purposeful. But generally, you shouldn't spend too much time doing it because it doesn't, on average, make a difference. So that really challenged a lot of the practices in schools in England. And I think we should challenge our practice because we can ask teachers to do work that they are wasting their time doing when they could be doing other things better. That's got more chance of success. So let's see an example. So one of the projects that we've recently reported upon is um, embedded formative assessment. This is Dylan Williams teaching learning communities um, around feedback. So two months gain, doesn't seem massive, but if we were to replicate that for all children in, in England, what that saw was the average attainment went up by one grade in the GCSEs. That's fantastic, that's a massive impact from a set of training sessions. But what was that project? Because just doing feedback was probably different to what that project was. So for Dylan William, feedback isn't just about teacher-student, like a tennis match. Also, it's about peers and really well-structured peer dialogue and peer discussion. It's about the learner themselves really getting to grips with evaluating how they've done, getting better over time, building up their own profile of learning, and that takes skill and nuance. So things like tools, like exam wrappers, where children have to reflect on not just their exam performance, but how they prepared for that exam, might just be one strategy 
to help give richer feedback to children. So what were the active ingredients? What were the things that made this project successful? We don't know exactly. No evaluation gives you all those easy answers. But here were some of the key elements of the project that was successful. It had 18 monthly sessions. 18, that's sustained over time. The evidence around teacher training is that it needs to be sustained over time. The learning community was quite small, between eight and 14. It happened to be across subject domains, so it brought in some interesting perspectives. It wasn't too big, it wasn't too small. It was a little bit like the Goldilocks group. Teachers had to report back in between. They had to trial things and then report back. So it made them responsible to responding to this training. And then this was interesting. Each community had a challenger. Some teacher had to take the mantle of the challenger and actually be a bit critical. Because it's too easy sometimes at school for everyone to agree, pat each other on the back and say we're all doing it great when we're not quite. And that seemed to improve the quality of dialogue between teachers. And there was a shared structured model. So I asked these questions then, because there were no schools in Sweden in that project. And yet there is work in Sweden around Dylan Williams' formative assessment. What ingredients did we have? What are the essentials that make it more likely for feedback to work in our school? And we're, we're asking better questions now. We've got some evidence to go on. We know that embedded formative assessment is probably a good thing, probably a good bet, but it still needs support. So, you know, things, just one intervention is never enough. We need to think through, we need to dig into it, but feedback might be the place we start because the evidence indicates its strength. Just in terms of the EF, you need support and tools. You can't go away from today and relay everything brilliantly to all your colleagues. That takes support. So we produce guidance reports for schools on topics. So we've got guidance reports on um, using teaching assistants. They're the uh, staff who support teachers. Literacy, numeracy, mathematics, metacognition, etc. Parental engagement, they're all freely available. Including implementation, how do you do things well? And they have recommendations in them that are teacher friendly, that you can dig underneath and talk about and use in training. We've also got a network of research schools because knowledge mobilization, research evidence needs teachers talking to teachers, not researchers standing on stages relaying expertise. It's a genuine dialogue in staff rooms. So that's one of the ways that we can help that, really training up teachers to do that well. And one of the exciting developments um, that we hope that people in Sweden are interested in is that we want to, we, and we have funding to have this model globally. So we have funding from Australia. Um, you can look at that blog to find out a bit more. But there's a global evidence fund. We want trials happening across the world, good quality trials. So it might be in Florida with Dylan William. It might be in England. It might be in Sweden. And it might be in Australia. And we pool that information about feedback and we get the best possible answers. So we're developing that. We're developing the toolkit in different countries because actually what's fantastic about today is all of those conversations with people you've met before but then hearing new perspectives, not just from the city down the road or the school on our street, but from people across the world. That's one of the rich, powerful experiences from today. So hopefully that would just whetted your appetite and give you a sense of some of the things we're doing in England. What are we already doing brilliantly in Sweden? What infrastructure and supports do we need going forward? There's some thoughts for you to go away and have that discussion with your colleagues. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, I've run out of time for questions, but if you want to grab me over there, please do. I'll take the mic off so it won't be very public.